All right, very good. While they're going, hey, Ed, Ed Bloom, could I ask you to bring me a bottle of water? I had a big old bo- uh, container of water, and I've already drank it all this morning. And I can tell I'm a little fuzzy already. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Folks, we are in Luke chapter 10 and 11. We're mostly in chapter 11 today. We thank you. I thank you, Mike, for reading the scriptures. Um, as we dig into today, <clears throat> uh, we have been looking at the life of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. And in the first nine chapters, the question has come up over and over again, who is Jesus? And as we've said before, now some of you have heard this multiple times, but others of you are new, so for those of you who are newer to Woodlands or maybe have missed it, we all need to answer the question, who is Jesus? Now, the gospel writer, Luke, he made it very clear to us who he believes Jesus is. For as far as he is concerned, he put a very lengthy and most likely a very extensive and expensive search, interviewing first-hand eyewitness accounts of people who knew Jesus, who saw him die, and then saw him alive after his death. And he became convinced that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And I personally believe that too. I believe that with all my heart. See, in the middle chapters of Luke, where we are right now, from the end of chapter 9 through chapter 18, Jesus sets out for Jerusalem. Because you see, the, the Gospels are a narrative. They're a story, right? And we follow along, and Jesus now is making his way toward Jerusalem. It is in Jerusalem that Jesus will be arrested. He will be convicted by a kangaroo court. And he will be hung on a cross to die. On his way to Jerusalem, there is a ton of teaching uh, that he gives us about how to and what it means to follow him. That is to be his disciple. So that is what our focus is today and for the foreseeable future. Now, Luke places the Lord's Prayer. That's, uh, for many of you, that'll be very familiar. You recognize those words as Mike was reading them. For others of you, you may not be familiar with that. But that little section where Jesus teaches us to pray is oftentimes called the Lord's Prayer. There's actually a longer, more familiar version in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, but he places it strategically in with the previous teaching to show us how to be a disciple. And this is the journey we've been on for the last several weeks. Uh, Luke is telling us that to, to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to, first of all, be a gospel messenger. A gospel messenger has a mission, has a message to share, and a motivation. And then number two, he tells us that we need to be a gospel neighbor. See, being a gospel messenger is all about sharing the message, right? Verbally, telling people about your faith in Jesus and inviting them to a relationship with him. Being a gospel neighbor is all about showing people that your love for Jesus is is lived out. It's manifested by your love for people around you and your willingness to serve them even though it may cost you a lot to do that. And so you can go back and check out these messages. You can go online at woodlands.cc. That's our website, woodlands.cc. Or you can also go uh, to YouTube. Open up YouTube where you can just type in Woodlands Community Church. That's where our channel can be found. And you can find all of our messages there uh, that you can go back and hear more of uh, of, of what I'm talking about. And then thirdly, Jesus says that you need to be a gospel prayer. Got to be a messenger. Got to be a neighbor. You got to be a prayer. And last week, we concentrated on the relationship between two sisters. Anybody remember who those two sisters' names were? Wow! Very impressive. Very impressive. You guys are paying attention. You just did my heart good, right? I'm good, man. Um, Martha... 
um, probably the older sister. She was distracted by doing, 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 and serving, while Mary made a better choice. Now, that's Jesus' words, not mine. Jesus said Mary made a better choice by recognizing that there comes a time when you need to stop doing, and you need to start being. You need to be in God's presence. So, the first thing we learned, the main point we got out of last week was Jesus is calling us into a deeply personal relationship with Him. And so, if you're here today and you're thinking, well, I mean, I'm a Christian, I'm a pretty good person, you know, I mean, I've gone to church off and on, um, you know, but you, when you hear that you're supposed to have a deeply personal relationship, you're kind of like, hmm, I'm not sure that describes me. I'm not sure I could say I have a deeply personal personal relationship, then I need to tell you with all the love in my heart, you've missed the mark. You've missed the mark of what it means to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ, right? Um, and so uh, I, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're watching online because that means today you can get this relationship on track. And, the, and today, the main point that we're going to look at is a follow-up to that first question, and that is how to grow this deeply personal relationship. Others of you are saying, man, I'd, I'd love to be close to Jesus. I've just never really been, feel like I've been really close to God, right? He's, he's always seemed kind of far off to me. If that's you, then today is for you, because Jesus tells us how to grow that deep relationship with the Father, so, Jesus makes three points to his followers in this next section. And we'll look at these three together. We'll spend most of our time on number one, and that's how to pray. Number two is called the impudence of prayer. How's that for a word, right? The impudence of prayer. And I'll take time to unpack that, and you'll see why. Uh, normally, I don't use words you have to describe or you have to define. Uh, but in this case, this word, there's a reason why we use that. And then finally, number three, the exhortation of prayer. Again, another kind of churchy word uh, that we'll unpack. So Jesus teaching on prayer in chapter 11, it explains how you can have the relationship that Mary had with Jesus, as we saw it described in chapter 10. Now, why do you want to have a relationship like that? Because Jesus was clearly very pleased with Mary. He clearly applauded her. He clearly affirmed her. So therefore, she becomes a model for us of the kind of relationship he wants to have with us. So uh, number one, let's dig in. If you're taking notes, write this down. How to pray. How to pray. In uh, chapter 11, verse 1, the disciples notice this about Jesus. It begins, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. You see, what they noticed was this was his normal behavior. It was just normal for Jesus to get up early and he would go to a certain place, it was a regular place, and he would pray. And as best we can tell, uh, Jesus prayed probably a couple hours a day, maybe more, and he seemed to have done it every day, uh, again, from what we can tell and what scholars tell us with their research. So they say, the disciples, how can we have the kind of relationship with the Father, Master, Lord, Jesus, that you have with him? And so he begins by saying, here's how you do it. I'm going to teach you to pray. At their request, they said, Lord, would you teach us to pray? And he said, here's how you do it. Number one, you begin by saying, Father, Father. Now, go, now, I just want to point this out, all right? Folks, sometimes we overlook just how cool the Holy Spirit is. Now, I've been in this series in Luke for quite a while, off and on, actually, for the last year and a half or so. And we end up on a passage that the main focus is Father on Father's Day. <clears throat> now, how about that? Is God good or what? God is good. You see, we need to take notice of the things God does all the time to show us that he's with us, that he's guiding us, uh, that he's leading us. And to me, that was just, that was just a, a real revelation. Somebody said, you're going to teach a Father's Day message or you're going to continue in Luke? They asked me that last week. I said, both. And they looked at me kind of funny like, 
What do you mean? I said, just stay tuned, all right? Come to church Sunday morning. You'll figure it out. So Jesus says, say, Father, Father. Now, the word we translate father in the English is from the Greek word patir. As we've mentioned uh, before here, uh, the Bible was originally written, the New Testament particularly, in Greek. And that Greek language, we've now translated it into English as well as many other uh, languages. But this word patir is, is, has a little more oomph to it. It's not really just father but it's actually an endearing term. It's a close personal term. It literally, you could translate it as dear father, right? I, I mean, we, over the years, we've gotten so used to writing like dear so-and-so, maybe, uh, you know, in, in, in a communication of some type. Uh, we kind of forget what that means. We say dear because it's endearing, right? There's a closeness, dear Father. And that's how Jesus tells us to pray. Now this sets uh, the focus uh, or the main principle uh, throughout the rest of this section. It all starts with Father. And this passage today we're looking at, it begins and it ends with Father. So the job of every father, dads listen up, the job of every father is to protect and to provide for your family, right? That's job one for every father, every man in the house. We protect and we provide for our family. It's what we do because we are, we are models of what the heavenly father does. And that's what he does for us. Dads, we are the sword and shield of our families. A phrase that I learned from my dear brother Jerome. We are the sword and shield of our families. We are the sword and shield of our communities. We are the sword and shield of our nation. Jesus says when we begin to pray, we pray, Dear Father, our God is our dear Father, and every word written in Scripture is there to protect us and provide for us. So every time you read God's Word, every time you read in Scripture, and you come across something that maybe you don't like very much, you need to understand that it is there to protect you. It is there to provide for you. It is there to protect the community. It is there to protect the nation. It is there to protect and to provide for the world. Let me give you just one quick example. You come across in Scripture where it says, do not lie. And y'all are like, well, I don't know, sometimes you're in a place where you really need to tell a lie, right? I mean, sometimes I do. No, Scripture says, do not lie. Why? Well, it's there to protect you and provide for you. Because I'll tell you this. Here's what, here's, here's what you got to understand about lying. If you tell the truth 100% of the time, I can trust you 100% of the time. If you tell the truth 90% of the time, what percentage can I trust you? Zero. I cannot trust you at all. Because you don't tell the truth all the time. And so I don't know if you're always telling the truth. Even when you're telling the truth, I don't know that you're telling the truth because sometimes y'all don't tell the truth. So God's word is to protect you and provide for you. Do not lie. It's one of the big ten. Right? It's in the Ten Commandments. So God's word is always to protect you and provide for you. By addressing God as Father like Jesus did, we acknowledge that we are children. We are children and we place childlike trust in Him. We have to always remember as we go to the Father, He is our dear Father and we need to go to Him as a child. Now this is a problem for many of us adults because many of us adults, we like to talk about how grown up we are. You know? You know the phrase, don't talk to me like that. I'm a grown beep adult. Right? I 
I would like to have worked that out with the tech team, but the timing might have been off, you know. I just. <laughs> we have to recognize we come to him as a father. We are children, and we never grow out of that status. I've got two boys. One's 34, one's 30. My, my youngest one, the 30-year-old, uh, ran a marathon yesterday. So proud of him. It's the third time he's ran this marathon, set a PR. That's a personal record if you don't know what that is. And I, I, I was a cross-country runner in high school and college. And it was, I was always going to run marathons after college. Well, guess what? <laughs> Didn't do it. <laughs> but my son has run three marathons. I'm so proud of him. That's a grown man kind of thing. But he is my baby boy. He is my baby boy. And I adore him, and I love him. And he can always come to me and say, Daddy. He can always come to me, Father. And man, I tell you what, when he comes to me like that, as a father, I just kind of melt in his hands. Right? You all know what I'm talking about. you all got those children that you feel the same way about. You know, I'm not just talking about my kids. I'm talking about your kids because you feel the same way. We must always remember our status in the heavenly kingdom. We are part of the family. In your mind, you need to resolve this, the fact that we are family. We're family. Father, son, daughter, brothers, sisters, Jesus says if you want to have an intimate relationship, if you want to have an extraordinary personal relationship, if you want a love relationship, you have to settle in your mind that you are family, that you are not like a subject and he's the king. You're not just a sheep and he's the shepherd, but you are a child and he's the father. And that's our status. And we have to settle that. We have to get that into our minds. For way too many of us, though, our relationship with God, with our Father, is like Martha's or like Peter's. Okay? To use a male example for this week, anybody who knows Peter, the disciple of Jesus, he was like a, he was like a daggone pendulum, right? He was, he'd do something great, and then he'd do something stupid. Right? I, I mean, he was the one who said, when Jesus said, Who do you say I am? He said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah. This came to you from the Father above. Golly, that was good. And in the next verses, Peter pulls Jesus aside after he talked about how he'd have to go to Jerusalem and die. And he puts his arm around Jesus and says, now, kind of feeling his oats because he, he just got complimented, right? Yeah. Jesus, you shouldn't talk like that. All right? You're, you're discouraging some of the followers. You, you, you need to back off on that gloom and doom talk. All right? Expecting probably another pat on the back, Jesus looked him right in the eye and said, Get behind me, Satan. Satan. He went from the proud boy, right? The golden child to Satan in a matter of moments. And folks, let's be honest. That's where a lot of us live. It's where a lot of us live. Our relationship is more like a pendulum, just swinging back and forth between duty like Martha and seeing his beauty like Mary did. 
We go through seasons where we're in church every week, right? Everybody, come along this journey with me. We go through seasons. We're in church every week. We're reading our Bible consistency. Maybe four times a week, maybe every day. We're spending time in worship and prayer. We're putting the praise music on, and we're just singing at the top of our lungs. Savior, you can move the mountains. I mean, you're just, you're just giving it everything you got, right? And you don't care who hears. You're just, you're just loving Jesus and worshiping Jesus and you're spending time in prayer and you're praying and you feel like a mighty warrior of God. And then something happens. Life happens. Maybe we get sick. Maybe we have surgery. Maybe we're knocked off our feet by, I don't know, a global pandemic. A holiday comes around, and we just get really, really busy, and then we're tired. We're either tired from hosting or we're tired from traveling. Bottom line is, instead of our focus being pure, and last week we talked about how pure means one thing. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. To be pure means you have one thing, one focus. Instead of our focus being pure, we get distracted, which is the word used of Martha last week. We get distracted by many things, and Jesus becomes just one of many things in our life. The pendulum has swung from one side all the way to the other. Is this making sense? Are y'all relating with me on this? Is it just me that has this happen in life? Right? No, everybody? Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Okay, okay. All right. So the bottom line is, here it is, Mary, Mary, and later in life, the Apostle John, okay, they demonstrated child-father relationship that our Heavenly Father wants for every single one of us. Our Father wants this with you. He desires this with you. He longs for this with you. He's not far away. He is close in proximity through His Holy Spirit. And on this Father's Day, I want to ask you dads, do you know that you have a Heavenly Father? You have a Heavenly Father. Do you know, dads, that you are His child? You are his child. That's right. Do you know you are his child? Do you know he is your daddy? Do you know you have a dad who is your hero that you can always turn to? I mean, one of the main reasons Jesus tells his disciples and then later us to start our prayer with Father is because the father-child relationship of all personal relationships is the most unconditional even more unconditional than the relationship with our spouse. Now let me unpack that and see if you don't agree. A clear illustration of this is let's say that your little four-year-old girl comes into your bedroom at 2 a.m. in the morning and starts pushing you and says, Daddy, I want a glass of water. What are you going to do? Now contrast that with your spouse who at 2 in the morning wakes up and starts nudging you and says, Hey, I need a glass of water. What are you going to say? Well, if you're newlyweds, you might get up and get it. But if y'all been married for more than a year, you're going to be like, What? You got two legs? Get your own dang drink. Or you might just lay there like you're really asleep and not roll over. <clears throat> Baby's crying. Oh. <clears throat> but if your four-year-old daughter comes and asks you for a drink of water, you're going to say, okay, sweetheart, let, let daddy get that for you. Let mommy get that for you. I don't know what your tone of voice will be exactly, but you will say, okay. You will say, okay. Why? Because it's the most unconditional relationship of a parent, a father, 
to a child. Great story to illustrate this, true story, um, happened a long time ago in uh, the war between the states, the Civil War, um, a young soldier, he was a Union soldier, and uh, he was in the army, and he lost his dad and his brother at the Battle of Gettysburg. The soldier decided to go to Washington, D.C., where he wanted to talk with uh, the president and ask for an exemption from his military service so he could go home and help his mom and his sister on the farm because they were the only ones that were left. There was no one there to help them. So um, when he arrived in Washington, after having received a legal furlough, uh, he came to Washington and uh, he went to plead his case at the White House. But as he approached the gate uh, to see the president, the guard who was on duty met him and said, you can't see the president, young man. Don't you know there's a war going on? He's very, very busy. Now, you need to get on back to the front line where you're supposed to be. Well, the, the soldier left, and he was just absolutely distraught because he knew that his mom and dad, his mom and his sister, were literally in danger. You know, with no one there to help with the crops, their lives were in danger. And, and so um, he went over and he sat on a bench that was actually very, very close to the White House, uh, just a few, uh, a, a few yards away. And um, as he sat there, this little boy just came walking up to him and said to him, Soldier, you look unhappy. What's wrong? And the soldier looked a little boy, and for whatever reason, he began spilling his guts to this little boy. He told him that his father and his brother had been killed in the battle at Gettysburg. He explained that his mother and sister had no one to help with the farm. The little boy listened, and then he said to him, I can help you, soldier. How this little boy could help him, he didn't know. But he took the soldier by the hand, right, and he led him back toward the White House. Now, as he got to the White House, he walked in the front gate. Apparently, no one noticed because they didn't stop him. They walked straight into the front door of the White House where, you know, there were generals and high-ranking officials, and no one stopped them as they passed right by. He couldn't understand exactly. He almost felt invisible. Why didn't anyone stop them? Finally, he reached the Oval Office of the President of the United States where the President was working, and the little boy didn't even knock. He just pushed the door open and walked right in with the soldier. There behind the desk stood Abraham Lincoln and the Secretary of State looking over battle plans on top of the de his desk. And the president then looked at the boy and then at the soldier and said, well, good afternoon, Todd. Tell me, who's your friend? And Todd Lincoln, the son of the president, said, Daddy, this soldier needs to talk to you. The soldier then pled his case to President Lincoln. And right then and there, the president wrote out his exemption so he could go home and take care of his mother and his sister. My friends, we have that kind of immediate access to the Father. We get to walk right in. We don't have to knock. We get to go right to him. Yeah? Right? And we get to talk to him and tell him and pour our hearts out to him. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 and 18 say, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. For through him we have access to the Father. Jesus has broken down the wall and gives us access to the Father through Him. Sons and daughters get access to their Father anytime, anywhere. I know that's true of my boys. If my boys, if I got a phone call from one of my boys right now, here in the middle of this message, I would pull it out, look at it, and I would say, folks, excuse me, just one moment. And I would say, hey, I'm a little busy, can I call you back? And they'd say, sure. They know better to call me on Sunday morning, by the way. <laughs> Jesus says, do you know your relationship with God is that loving? Do you know it's that loving? Do you know it's that intimate? Do you know, brothers and sisters, that you are that cherished by the Heavenly Father? 
He longs to be with you. He longs to spend time with you. He longs to bless you. Jesus wants his disciples to start their prayer with Father because you must always remind yourself to start any talk with God as his child. That's where it begins. You come to him as your child. You have to drill it into your brain because this is the key to everything that Jesus follows in the model prayer that he gives us. Every prayer, folks, every prayer that Jesus prays in Scripture, every single time, if you track it all the way through the four Gospels, every time Jesus begins by praying, Father, dear Father, Heavenly Father, he always begins with prayer of the Father, except once. There's one time he does not address God as Father. As Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? Why at this time of his most desperate need? Because at that moment, there was a break in the relationship between Jesus and the Father. And Jesus taking on all the sins of the world, your sins, my sins, he could not stand in the presence of the holy. You see, Jesus got kicked out of the family. He was getting what we deserve. What we all know deep in our hearts, we should get. God shouldn't let us into his family. He's holy. He's perfect. Why would he let a sinner like me be his son? Why would he adopt, adopt someone like me? And every single one of us, if we look in the mirror and get very, very honest with ourselves, we would say the same thing. Well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. Oh, come on. You're a civil person. You're a nice person. But you're a sinful person, like me. And I don't deserve heaven. And Jesus knew that. And so he stretched out his arms on the cross. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried out the words that each and every one of us would have to cry out. And then be rejected from the heavenly family if he had not done that. You need to settle this in your heart. You need to settle this in your mind once and for all. That you're in the family of God and you will not be kicked out. They say membership has its privileges. But blood is thicker than water. We are his blood. We're adopted. But we become his blood because of the blood Jesus shed on the cross for you and me. And all we need to do is receive it. Is receive it. Settle it in your mind that you are a child of the Father. Then Jesus will listen to your prayers. Will intercede on your behalf to our Father in heaven. And he will, he will grant you the deepest desires of your heart. And we'll find out more about that and more about what that means next week as we continue looking at how to be a disciple by being a prayer. I'm going to invite you all to stand, if you will. And we're going to close together by praying together the Lord's Prayer.
It's coming up on the screen. I know many of you probably know the Lord's Prayer by heart, but I also recognize some people are guests and new here, and so we have the Lord's Prayer up here. There he is. Pray with me if you will. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Mike, would you uh, take us home? Thank you, thank you, thank you. You may be seated. We're going to be seated, just to be raised again in short, just a moment. A <laughs> moment's time. I just want to kind of give you guys a heads up. Out in the front lobby here, we have uh, some pictures. So if you're a dad, take some pictures with your children. There's a, a scene set up, a Father's Day scene set up. And also outside, there's some snacks and games. So I encourage you to stick around and fellowship and just enjoy Father's Day. And with that, would you please stand? I want, to, <laughs> I want to close us with a benediction. A benediction from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. It reads, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Have a blessed week. Thank you.